Good morning and happy Sabbath. I would like to welcome everyone who's joining us wherever you are across the globe to Central Study Hour. And th for those who's joining us in Sanctuary, welcome and happy Sabbath. This Sabbath day, it's a blessed Sabbath day. We will be studying the Word of God from the Sabbath school lesson. But, but first, let's sing uh, two song requests we receive. The first one comes from Rani Wenor of Rockland, California. And the requested song is song number two, 279, Only Trust Him. Let's sing this with full soul and heart. All stanza. trust him he will save you he will save you he will save you and i thank you for sending that song request uh, if you have a favorite hymn that you would like to share with us we'll be happy to sing with you on the upcoming sabbath uh, please visit the church website saccentral.org uh, contact us and also go to the csh hymn request tell us more about yourself where you're from email address and of course the song request We'll join you on the upcoming Sabbath. And the second song request comes from Asita Sabatina. That's my wife's sister from Indonesia, West Java. Uh, she requested hymn number 311, I Would Be Like Jesus. Let's all be like Jesus. 311, all stanza. Yeah. 
for singing with us. Let's bow our head for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for another Holy Sabbath day that we're going to be spending time with you, Lord. As we're going to be opening the scripture to get closer to you, we pray that you keep us away from all distractions of the world. That we may plug in our faith through Jesus Christ in worship and adoration. We pray for Brett Stebbins, who will be leading us to the green pastures. We pray that you prepare our, our hearts and minds and speak through him, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Sabbath School will be uh, presented by our head elder, Brett Stebbins. And we're talking about lesson number two, a day in the ministry of Jesus. And the memory text is taken from Mark 1, 17. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. I hope you have a blessed study. Hello and welcome to Central Study Hour here at beautiful Sacramento, Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, if you are here and you uh, are watching online and you, for some reason, really resonate with this lesson and you don't have a copy of it and you would like a copy, uh, please reach out to us at uh, saccentral.org and we have our, our phone number there as well, 916-457-6511. Give us your information and we'd love to be able to send you a copy of this lesson. It is offer c 202 Four two eight, and it is lesson number two in our quarterly on the book of Mark. And you know, as we were just singing that song, being like Jesus, I, I looked at the cover, right? And the the cover is very powerful. You know, you're you're looking at at Mark, an illustration of Mark, and he looks really he's he's really thinking about the words that he is to put on this paper, and he's got the cr the uh, the crown. Of thorns right in front of him. It just really impacted me as I was looking at that, as we were reading that hymn, just to think about the, the human hands and the human mind that were guided by God to be able to put all these wonderful words um, in history for us so that we could read. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be going over uh, a day in the ministry of Jesus. That's the title for today, for lesson two in this wonderful quarter, uh, quarterly. A day in the ministry of Jesus. What would you guys give to be able to spend a day and be there for a day and just observe Jesus for a day in his ministry? Wouldn't that be just be fantastic? It would be amazing. But the, then the, the problem is, is, you know, if an angel would be able to grant this wish to us and we'd be able to see it, what day would you pick, right? If you had to pick one day in the ministry of Jesus, what day would you pick, right? You could do the Sermon on the Mount. You could do the, the you know, the... Um, the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, when, when Jesus is there, you could do uh, the communion service. I mean, there's, there's so many wonderful days. It would be hard to pick one day in the, in the day of the ministry of Jesus. Well, today, we may not be able to transform ourselves and be able to see actually Jesus uh, doing this, but we do get to study this day in the ministry of Jesus. And we're going to find that in the book of Mark, chapter 1. We're going to be there for, for most of the lesson. And Bona already read our, our memory verse, uh, but I'll read it again as we get started here, just because it really keys off what we're going to be talking about today. And it says this, Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Did Jesus know what kind of a reaction he would get from the disciples when he used those words? Jesus was, was very precise with his words. And he used these words as a call to these men. And he used these words because they were fishermen. They would be able to understand what this, what this call is. It made sense to them. It made sense to them. And as well, we, need to, we can see that ministry is actually a lot like fishing. Right? And these men understood that. They, they knew that it was like fishing. You're just targeting a different species. Right? So he's saying, I want you guys to work, continue doing what you're doing, but instead of fish, I want you to throw nets around men and women and children and bring them in towards Jesus, right? Wouldn't that be funny? The disciples, they really didn't understand they're throwing nets on people. That nah, wouldn't happen. So they, they kind of knew that they were going to have this job, and the job was going to be similar to the job that they had. 
And uh, since we're going over, we're still just in lesson two, we're going over the, the first chapter in the book of Mark, and all of the Gospels start off a little different. They don't all start off just with the, with the same event in, in there. So in the book of Matthew, we see that Jesus calls his disciples, <clears throat> and he preaches, uh, and he has the Sermon on the Mount. That's how it starts off. And then the book of Mark tells us the story uh, of Jesus, and it tells us the story of his, his sermon and him in the, in the church, preaching in the, in the synagogue. And then um, we also see John starts off with the wedding, right? It starts off with the wedding at Cana, and then um, he also is, is then sharing his, his first miracle and his first sign of, that, of who he is. And then in Mark, recounts at the beginning the call of the four disciples, the call and what it is to call them to be disciples. And then it also describes a Sabbath day with Jesus, and that is in uh, Capernaum. So one thing that we, that I'd like to, to point attention to, the lesson points attention to, is that the word immediately is used a lot in the book of Mark. Immediately. So the author wanted to share with people that Jesus in his ministry was a very, it was a very fast ministry. It was very uh, fast moving. It had a lot of speed to it, right? Jesus was not out preaching and teaching for, you know, 50 years, 40 years, right? It was a short amount of time, and there was a lot of work that needed to be done in that short time. So Mark uses immediately as transitions a lot, immediately and then fast and then right then, right? He uses these words. So I just wanted you at the, in the introduction to notice that because we're going to see immediately used in a lot of the verses that we're going to be uh, reading about. So this lesson today is going to focus on the call of the first four disciples, and then it's going to share a day in the life of Jesus and what he did. And it's great. We're going to be able to share that together, right? Like we talked about at the beginning, we, we may not be able to be there physically and, and, or just observe Jesus, but we can through his word, right? The faithful servants that wrote this word, guided by God, gives us and paints a really good picture of what a day in the ministry of Jesus looks like. So follow along with me to the next uh, day is Sunday, and it is Follow Me. The title is Follow Me, right? And that was very common in Jesus. It, it, his last words that he used before he had the disciples come with him, he, he, he bid them to follow him, right? And the lesson asks us to take a look at uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20, and then it has a question. It says, who are the men Jesus called as his disciples, and what was their response? <clears throat> Let's go ahead and read. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and follow along. If not, I will go ahead and read those for us. It is Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 16. And then it says, And he walked by the Sea of Galilee. It's Jesus, right? He's walking. And he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me. Right? And I will make you become fishers of men. In verse 18, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Right? There's that word, immediately. In verse 19, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in their boat mending their nets. And immediately, two times already, we're seeing immediately, and immediately he called them and left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So we get this picture, right? And we see this, that Jesus, he's walking along the beach. It's a beautiful day. And he comes across uh, these, these first disciples, and all of them are fishermen. Fishermen are who Christ decides to pull into his ministry. He doesn't go into the church and find the priests. He doesn't go into the city government and find high officials. He walks on the beach, and he finds fishermen. And those are the people that he selects to do his work, right? And Jesus' call to these men was not very difficult. It was simple, it was direct, and it was also prophetic, the way he called his disciples. And uh, he indicates to them what they're going to be doing. So he asks, follow me, and then he tells you, you're going to continue to be fishermen. You're just going to go after a different species. 
you're going to be fishing for men now and women and people and souls. And he kind of explains it to them. And he tells them that. And, um, you know, he kind of, in, in that whole dialogue there, in, in simple words, he, he basically tells them that he, they are still going to be catching fish. Right? They're, they're still going to be catching. And, and fish in those days especially near city ports, was very important for food and substance for the community and for, for everybody there. You know, they had the small fish, they'd dry them out, the larger fish, uh, they would cut them up and cook them. Uh, around the, the ocean, around the coast, the fish were very important. So we, we're kind of getting the idea that these people, these men are going to be gathering these fish, bringing them into this community so that they can provide for the other people there. It's kind of interesting uh, if you if you kind of take a look at that, you know the the correlation between fishermen and actually what the ministry is and what the ministry is about. It's also interesting if we you know we can read that that those verses real quick and we get we get out of what we just talked about. But if we look into not only did he just call fishermen, you know instead of higher up people, he also called two different types of fishermen, right? Because uh, he talks about the, the first two, right? And they had their nets, and they were on the shore. And they were throwing their nets into the ocean from the shore. They were not in a boat. Those are what we would kind of call are the, poor, the poor man's fishermen, right? They caught a lot of small fish, uh, and they were there. Not a lot of big fish, and they couldn't afford a boat. And then we see another group, another group and they have... The two sons, they have the dad, they have hired servants, they have a boat, right? Those are the fishermen that are, we would call a real fishermen in those days, production fishermen. Uh, they would go out and cast their huge nets and bring in huge fish. And Jesus calls these two different types of fishermen, one poor and one fairly well off, that they have their own business. And then if we, if we think about the, the fishing aspect of it, do you catch something every time you go out and go fishing? No. Well, we see that in the Bible. Sometimes they had very empty nets. Sometimes they had very full nets, right? And there are many times when you go out and you go fishing and you don't catch anything at all. I used to fish a lot. I used to be an avid fisherman. And sometimes we'd catch a lot of fish. And, but a lot of the times I would come back and my wife says, how many fish did you get? And I didn't get anything. She's like, why do you go? You know, it, it's, it's the sport of it, right? It, it's different. It's being out in nature, and um, it's a little different. But when you're out there and you're a fisherman, and you go out and you're throwing out your nets or you're throwing out your lines and you don't catch anything, and you go to one spot, do you just go home? No. You move around. You pick up your stuff. You pick everything up. You go to the next spot. Well, this is the spot where we're going to find fish. Okay, nothing there? Okay, let's pick up and let's go. So all of this, when Jesus was explaining that I want you to be fishers of men, these men are thinking, they know this. They're, be, they're able to relate to this very well. And sometimes when you go out, you catch a lot. You can catch a lot of fish. When we go out as fishers and as disciples, because we're still called to be fishers of men as well, right? Not just the, the disciples. Do we catch something every time we go out? No. No. Every time we give a Bible study, does it lead to baptism? No. But what do we do? We're just like fish. We pick up, we grab our nets, we grab our fishing poles, and we go on to the next one. I, uh, fishing can be very frustrating, and these disciples knew it as well. Fishing can be very frustrating. Especially, I used to like to go fishing up in the, uh, in the mountains, a lot of clear water, and you can see the fish. So you're going out and you can get up on a rock and you look down this beautiful stream and you see these large fish down there and, and you get your fishing pole and you put on the bait or the lure and you cast it down. And it can be very frustrating because you see the fish right there. You see your lure going right in front of their faces and nothing, right? And it's very frustrating. But then it's also awesome when you throw out that lure and you're reeling it in, and you see it come right next to a fish, and the fish comes out, and boom, bites the lure, and you catch the fish, right? 
So we see that when we are actually out doing our fishing, right? We're not out there fishing blind. Maybe if we do a post on Facebook or something like that, we're kind of blind fishing out there waiting for, for bites. But when we're out there and we're fishing and the disciples are fishing, you can see the fish. You can see the men, the women. And you see this lure going right in front of them. And sometimes they grab it and sometimes they don't. But you know what? Sometimes what you have to do is you have to change baits. You have to change your lure. Maybe a different color is going to work. Right? So when we're dealing with family or we're trying to study with somebody or we're trying to share the word of God, sometimes we need to share tactics. Sometimes we just need to pick up and move on and go on to something else. And all of these things, these men understood when Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They knew it wasn't going to be easy. They knew it was going to be tough, just like the job that they were doing. But it doesn't matter. We're all called still to be fishermen. It doesn't matter if we, if we only have a net, if we have a boat. It doesn't matter what resources we have. We're called to go out and, and, and go fishing. So... The question that, that comes up in the lesson is, why did these men follow Jesus right away? Right? We see that these, it, it looks like in this, if we just stick with the book of Mark, it looks like these men are there. They see Jesus. Jesus asks them to follow, and they immediately leave. That's what it looks like. Right? But if we go to John chapter 1, verses 40 and 42, it says this. One of the two who heard John speak, which is John the Baptist, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be named, named Cephas, which translates to a stone. So we see, right, we see this interaction in the book of Mark that Jesus says, follow me, and right away they follow. But if we go to another book in the Bible and we study a little bit more on some of the history, right, Mark, Mark wants us to immediately, fast, fast-paced, right? He doesn't get into a ton of the different details. But in the book of John, it gets into the details that when Jesus asked these men to follow him, they knew him. They had heard of him. They had even met him. So it's not like these men just made this decision right away, just out of the blue, I just met you, and I'm going to follow you. There was some, some thought that went into it. It was, it was a calculated decision on their end to follow Jesus, right? And we, and we see that. So Sunday, the lesson is follow me, right? Follow me. If we go into Monday, we'll get into an unforgettable worship service. How many of you have unforgettable worship service that, that you can, can talk about at church? As I was thinking about this and preparing this lesson, I tried to think, what are some of the unforgettable church services I have been at? You know, when I was a kid, uh, my dad was a pastor, and I still remember seeing him preach and the energy that he had and the way he spoke, and it was, it was wonderful. I remember those church services. He wasn't a pastor later on in my life, but when I was really young, he was. And uh, I remember those services. It was amazing. I was so proud of my dad. I just, he, he was my idol at the time, and, and uh, just, it, was, it was great to see him. So those are unforgettable. I also remember having a church service on the top of a volcano in Mexico. It wasn't an active volcano, but we were out there, and we were doing a mission trip, and we had this church service on top of this volcano overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It was beautiful. I, I can't forget that service. It was amazing. It was completely amazing. So I remember that. That's, that's one of the unforgettable services for me. I also remember a, uh, when I was young, there was a Christmas concert. And I was probably 12 or 13 at the time. I remember being at a Christmas concert. And the way they were speaking and the, the message and the songs, I, I broke out into tears because I was really touched by, that, by what was said and what was going on in that service. So I remember that. Uh, I remember the, uh, my mom ended up getting me a cassette tape. You guys remember cassette tapes? I got a cassette tape of that, of that service, and I would listen to it at night. It was an unforgettable service for me. 
One of the other ones was, I remember, it wasn't in the Seventh-day Adventist church, but I remember uh, seeing a lady walk up in the middle and completely go into convulsions, and supposedly she was speaking in, in tongues when I was a young kid. So that was another unforgettable church service that, that I, was, I got to witness. That's kind of weird. So if, if you can think about unforgettable church services that you have been at for good reasons, and then think about the service that we're going to talk about right now, because this is a very interesting service. And it starts off in, uh, in Mark uh, 1, 22. So Jesus had just gathered his disciples, and he's bringing them to church. And he's like, I, I'm, I'm going to speak, so come in here. So Mark 21, start with verse 20, uh, Mark 1, 21 says this. Then they went to, into Capernaum, and immediately, there's that word again, immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. So in one way, they, this is one of the unforgettable things that happened in this church service, that Jesus, when he was up and when he talked, he spoke as one that had authority, as one who had authority over the word of God, like he wrote it, like it was part of him. Right? So all these people are astonished. They're just like, wow, this, I've never heard anybody speak like this. Right? And it's, you know, they, they're used to having these scribes and these people go up and they speak and they read and they're probably good, but it was nothing like Jesus. Right? It's, it's like, um, you know, when you, it, it, with, in respects to authority, right? If, if you're doing something wrong or you're breaking the law and, and somebody else comes up and says, hey, you shouldn't do that. It comes with a certain amount of weight. But if a police officer comes and tells you that same thing, it comes with a little bit more authority, right? You're not supposed to cross the street right there if somebody tells you, like, ah, I had to cross the street. Cop comes and says, hey, you're not supposed to cross the street there. Like, okay. So these people are at the, in this church service and they're like, wow, this, this is different. This is hitting home differently. Same words I've read before, but this is just really hitting home different. Right? So there Jesus was. Um, the people were, were hearing the word of God like they have, have not heard before. And uh, let's continue on about this uh, unforgettable worship service in this uh, church. So Mark uh, chapter 1, we'll read 23 through 28. It says this. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's, that's pretty significant what this uh, demon-possessed man is saying here. We'll go into that in a minute. Uh, verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet. Shh, quiet, don't call me that here. Come out of him, he says. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed, uh, convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What, a, what new doctrine is this? For the authority he commands, even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately, there's that word again, immediately his fame spread throughout all the regions of Galilee. So this, if you were at this service, it's going to be a very unforgettable service for those two reasons. Jesus is speaking like he's never spoken before. And there's this demon-possessed man that is coming out. And he is, remember, Jesus is first starting his ministry. And this demon-possessed man comes out and names him and labels him right then and there the Holy One of God. And all the people, are, they're, they're, they're capturing this information. Like, what? wait, what did he say? With this authority in his speaking and this demon-possessed man now calling him the Holy One of God, they, things are happening differently. They're, these people are a little confused at, at kind of what's going on. And it's, it's interesting that uh, the demon-possessed man is the one that identifies Jesus for who he really is. Right? The, p other people aren't really figuring out. Even though Jesus is speaking with authority, they're not really seeing that he is who he is. Right? And the demon-possessed man calls him directly out who he is. And Jesus, what was his answer? Jesus answered to that when he said, I said, quiet, don't say that, please. 
I don't want to be identified as that right now. Jesus wanted to just be able to go in and speak with the people and have the people feel the authority in which he spoke and the way he spoke and saw that he was different. Jesus, that's what he wanted. He didn't want his name to be fully out there right now. And Satan, who is always behind all of this, says, I want to call you out for who you are. Because if Satan would have right away, these people are just getting to know Jesus and his message, and if Satan would have called him out and people would have identified him that he was the Messiah right away, they would have said, no, 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 right? So Satan was there trying to disrupt Jesus, but he didn't do a very good job. Because it says here, and immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee, right? So Satan tried to do something, but it didn't work because Jesus is always going to, we, we already know the end of the story, right? So, and when Jesus's name was being shared around all of Galilee, it was being shared not so much as him as the Holy One of God, but it was the way he spoke that was being shared, right? It was the way he commanded authority. And it was the way that he spoke and demons came out. And it, what it really did was it planted seeds all over that city of who Jesus was. And later on, they were going to really, really notice who Jesus really was. Okay, let's go on. A continuation of this, we'll find this in Tuesday. Because all of this, all of this lesson goes one after another after another. So Tuesday, it says more Sabbath ministry. So now after Jesus is done, after they leave the church, there's something else that's going on, right? This would, this would have been a really good day if we were to be able to observe Jesus in action for one day. This would have been a good day to see it. Okay, so we'll continue in Mark uh, chapter 1, and we'll start with verse 29, and we'll go through 31. Now as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told her about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And then there's that wonderful word. And immediately the fever left her and she served them. Verse 32. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So we see this. This is a continuation right, at, right after this church service, right? And uh, notice the words again. It says, and they told her of her at once, and immediately the fever left. So we're seeing the speediness, right? Jesus, he's going along. If we really think about all that we're going to talk about today, all of these things happened in one day. It was fast. Jesus started off his ministry. When he started it, he went. All right? and, that, and that's what uh, the author Mark wants to, to relate to us, just how fast this ministry went. And uh, this is just a, a wonderful and, and great passage here because we see that Peter's mother-in-law is sick and she's got a fever. And fevers back then weren't just like fevers now. You take some Tylenol or... Uh, Motrin, and you can get it down, and you can do different things. Fevers usually meant you you had some type of an infection, some type of a virus, and it, it fevers were more like life or death. You're either going to live or you're going to die, and a lot of people died from simple things back then. Uh, and Jesus came, and he healed her. He healed this woman. He had not known her, and he just went, and it says that he reached down and took her hand and lifted her up. So just imagine that Jesus. After all he's been through in this one day, he's coming down, and he's just, he just lifts up this lady. He doesn't ask her any questions. There's no words here that are said. He just goes out, and his followers that he just asked to follow says, hey, Lord, I need you. Look at my mother-in-law. And he just, he just picks her up. And immediately she was well. There was no questions, because Jesus' ministry was to heal. That's what he wanted to be there for. He wanted to heal. He wanted to help. He wanted to share, right? And he needed to support the people that he just called. He needed to support um, that group of people right there. And notice at the end of uh, verse uh, 31, 
it says that she immediately served them. Right after she was healed, she didn't take any time to rest up or anything like that. She got up right away, was completely 100% better, probably 110%, feeling better than she'd ever felt before, and she served them. You know what I think happened? I think Jesus was hungry, and he looked around, and he saw a whole bunch of fishermen, dirty hands, probably didn't know how to cook, And he sees the one that knows how to cook is sick and laying in bed. So what I think happens is Jesus healed the cook. He didn't want to eat from the disciples. He wanted the mother-in-law to make the food. That's what I think. I think he healed the cook because he wanted some strength, because he was going to have to do a great mission after this, so he healed the cook. But Jesus, he he just was there to heal, right? Really, he was just there to heal anybody. Because what does he do after this? Because the second part of this message that that we just read here, the second part of this was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law first, and then Jesus eats, he's fed, and then when the Sabbath ends, what happens? He says that the whole city waited and lined up to be healed by Jesus. Everybody who was sick in that city or demon-possessed, they got in line to be healed by Jesus. I wanted to, at the, at the very end of your lesson, uh, the last two paragraphs on Tuesday, it has a quote from the Desire of Ages. I'd like to read that because it really paints a wonderful picture of what was happening there. It says, hour after hour they came and went, for none could know whether tomorrow would find the healer still among them. Never before had Capernaum witnessed a day like this. The air was filled with the voice of triumphs and shouts of deliverance. Are you you guys listening to this? What a wonderful scene that this is. Shouts of triumph, voices of triumph and shouts of deliverance. The Savior was joyful in the joy he had awakened. As he witnessed the sufferings of those who had come to him, his heart stirred with sympathy. He rejoiced in his power to restore them to health and happiness. The second paragraph says this, not until the last sufferer had been received did Jesus cease his work. It was far into the night when the multitude departed and silence settled upon the home of Simon. The long, exciting day was past and Jesus sought rest. But while the city was still wrapped in slumber, the Savior rising up, a great while before day, went out and departed into a solitary place, place, and there he prayed. Right? This is is wonderful. We we really get to have this, this picture of what's going on painted in front of us on just this joyous, wonderful act. All of these people are there, and they're all being healed. People are lining up. And usually, what usually happens when you line up? When you get a whole bunch of people lining up, people are frustrating. There's other people trying to cut in front of it. It's like, it's not, this, this line is not like the line at the DMV, right? This line is, is everybody's going good. Everybody's happy. Jesus is going to heal us, right? Everybody's in line and they, they have this anticipation that they're going to be healed from these things that they have been suffering from for a long time. And all of this is still possible today. Jesus can heal people. Jesus can heal families. Jesus can heal whole cities. We're seeing this. Jesus can heal whole nations. Jesus can heal the whole world. But nobody's really getting in line anymore. Jesus went through the whole line. If you want to be healed and you want to be with Jesus, get in line. He's going to attend everybody in that line. But people aren't lining up these days. That's why we need to go out and fish them out, right? We need to go bring them to the line, right? Throw the nets on the people. Grab them in like the disciples. So at the end, all of the people were healed that wanted to be healed. And the second paragraph that we read in the Desire of Ages says that the people, you know, and we just imagine as these people were sleeping. Some of these people that were sleeping well at night for the first time in years, right? People who were once terrorized at night by demons, people who laid awake at night with pain and suffering and could not sleep. It says that the whole city was quiet. 
Everybody was sleeping. It's, it's, it's wonderful to, to hear that, right? Everybody just quiet and sleeping. Have you ever tried to sleep in an emergency room? There's people crying and yelling and the doctors going all around. Have you ever been to an emergency room where everybody's healed and everybody's nice and quiet? I'm guessing it would sound really great. You know, like this whole city was quiet. And as this whole city was quiet, after everybody who wanted to be healed and needed to be healed was healed, Jesus took a short nap, and then it says he got up before the sun even rose, and he was doing what? He was back in prayer. He was back working again, right? Let's move on into Wednesday. Wednesday, the title of Wednesday is the key here. The secret of Jesus' ministry. We're going to learn the secret today. And this is still a continuation of what had happened in, in previously that we just read. And uh, this oh, focuses on Jesus' actions, the actions that he took after he did all that healing. So we find ourselves still in the book of Mark, and we're going to read verses 35 through 39. And it says this, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. Simon and those who were with him searched him out, when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. It makes sense, right? He just did this great work. Everybody's looking for him. They want to invite him to, to eat, have a potluck, to be with them, to talk to them. And verse 38 says this, but he said to them, let's go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose, I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, casting out demons. So we see here in this first part of what we read, and that what, this is what the secret is, right? Is Jesus was a man of prayer. Prayer was Jesus' secret weapon, right? And also, if we go to Luke 6, 12, it says this. Now it came to pass in those days that they went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Question, friends. If prayer was the key for Jesus... How much more is it the key for us today? Right? If that was his secret weapon, if that was the key to his ministry, how much more do we need that today? So let's take a little bit to reflect. How are we doing? How is our prayer life? I, I can probably guess that none of us here stayed up all night to pray. Just guessing. But did we pray? Did we pray everything that we needed to? Do we have that communication with God every day? Is it constant? Right? Because it's not easy, right? And I don't think it was easy for Jesus. We see how busy he was. He had just gone to sleep. It says well into the night he was healing people. And then it says well before daylight he was out praying. Right? So Jesus put more emphasis on prayer than he did sleep and rest. So we just need to reflect, even though it was challenging for Jesus, and it's challenging for us, are we doing it? Are we challenging ourselves in prayer? I think we should constantly be challenging, our, challenging our, ourselves in prayer, making lists, having that time, even having some silent prayer and waiting for God to be able to give us things to pray about. All right? We need to be in prayer because this was the secret weapon of Christ, and it should be our secret weapon today. It says in these verses that everybody was looking for Jesus, right? Everybody in that town was looking for him. They, they wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to know more. They wanted to hang out with him. But what was Jesus' answer? He's like, nope. That's great. I love you guys. That's why I healed you, but I need to go. My mission is not to stay here with you guys all the time. I need to move on. And his answer was, to his disciples especially, nope, pick everything up, get your nets, pick up all your stuff. We have more work to do. We're going to do this again, just not here. We're going to go over to the next town and do the same thing. The seeds were planted in that town. Everything was done. Jesus knew that he had done everything that he needed to do. His plan was complete, and he needed to move on. So if we take anything away from Wednesday's lesson, if we take anything away from all of this lesson that we're studying, 
is the secret weapon in Jesus' ministry was prayer. And if we are still a part of Jesus' ministry here on earth today, then it continues with us. It's a continuation. Prayer is our secret weapon as well. And a lot of the times, we forget that we have this secret weapon in our back pocket. We try and do things on our own. And we need to remember, when we're going through difficult times, when we feel exhausted, when we feel like we don't know where to go, remember that secret weapon that you have that will help you and guide you through everything. Because we are, we're studying here the ministry of Jesus. We're getting a lot of facts. We're seeing what's done. We're also called to be fishers of men. But this, this one thing right here is key, the prayer. And I think there's, there's several of you prayer warriors here, and I'm sure there's, there's plenty watching that you, you know. You know prayer is that, is that secret weapon. So let's go ahead and move on to Thursday. And Thursday is interesting. It says, can you keep a secret? And you guys know, can you keep a secret? Some people keep secrets well, some people don't. Who can you trust with a secret? Can you keep a secret? So this is the story about Jesus healing a leper. And we're still in the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. I'll go ahead and read that here. Mark 1, starting with verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, saying to him, If you are willing you can make me clean. Verse 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately, there's that word again, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, so Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying to him. See that you say nothing to anyone but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer your cleansing to those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Ending with verse 45, it says, However, he went out and began to proclaim it, proclaim it freely and spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction." Now, I absolutely love verse 40. And I don't know how, if you're reading the word of God in this, you can really hold it together emotionally because this is so powerful, what we just read here. A man that is suffering and that is an outcast and is that set aside, he's separated from his family, his friends, the whole community, knows who Jesus is, he comes up to him, he approaches him, he gets down on his knee, and he says to Jesus, if you are willing, right, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This man knows that Jesus can make him clean. He knows who Jesus is. He's heard about Jesus. And he sees this. Just what an incredible scene. Somebody going in front of Jesus and saying that, if you are willing. Was Jesus willing? Yeah. He's always willing, right? He's always willing to heal. So the question to you that I have for you is, how well do you think Jesus was able to hold it together emotionally when this man comes to him and asks this? Right? I mean, he wants to heal people so much, and he wants people to know him for who he is. And then this man, this outcast, this nobody, this, this somebody that people don't even remember anymore, comes to him and says, if you are willing, and Jesus is just, yeah, of course I'm willing. Right? Jesus is probably holding back tears because somebody's recognizing him for who he is and he's asking with his whole heart to be healed. And of course, Jesus heals him. He answers, I am willing, be cleansed. That's his answer. And this act right here would have made Jesus unclean. That's why, because he touched this man and was with this, this leper, that's why he asked him to keep a secret. He says, please, 
what I need you to do is I need you to go to the priest because if you would go to the priest and they would see that you're clean, then I would be clean, right? Because the leprosy w- was gone. So he asks this man to keep a secret. And um, does this man keep a secret? No, he doesn't. He doesn't keep a secret at all. What does it say? It says, however, he went out and began to proclaim it freely. So this man did not keep up his end of the bargain. But do you think Jesus was really mad at him? He wasn't mad. He was maybe even just a little frustrated. He's like, oh, well, now the priests have a thing. But he wasn't worried about it. And I don't know about you, but when I've been healed... And when Jesus has taken me into his arms and I got to know Jesus, I wouldn't have been able to keep that secret. And anybody, if you have had a true conversion and if you have truly met Jesus, it's impossible to keep it in. If you truly, truly known Jesus and wanted to follow him, you you can't, we can't keep it inside. We try. You know, I'll have conversations with my brother and sometimes, or, or, or other people and they go, okay, I already know your answer. Now, what is my answer? God, because yeah, there is no other answer, right? So Jesus was not displeased, right? He, he kind of knew that this man wasn't going to keep this secret. And we, we can't keep the secret as well. And we shouldn't be keeping, no, Jesus is not asking us right now to keep his work a secret. He's asking us to share everything, to share to everybody, to become fishers of men. Right? That's what he's calling us to do. We don't have to keep it inside. This was just one case, and it didn't work. Jesus' word is, God's word is going to be spread. So that's basically the lesson. So if we go back and we really think about what we've gone over, we've touched on a couple of issues here. Jesus calls everyone to him to be fishers of men, regardless of who we are and what we have. It doesn't matter if you're the poorest fisherman and you're just sitting there on the shore or if you've got a big boat and an enterprise, multiple boats and hired men. Jesus calls us all to be fishers of men. He calls us all to follow, to see his example, and then to go do it ourselves, right? The second thing that he wants is he wants us to be involved in his work, right? He wants us to not only follow and watch, he wants us to become involved in his work and to to help heal. We can help heal other people, right? We can. Sharing God's word with somebody, having them learn the health message and they'll be able to heal themselves through the power of God and eating right and, and living a right life, right? He wants us to become involved in his work. And we learn that he is willing and wanting to heal us all. All of us who are lined up, if we all line up to be healed, he wants to heal us all. He really does. He cares about us. He loves us. He wants us to be healed. The question still is, are we going to get in line? Are we going to guide people to where that line is? Prayer is the secret weapon that we all need in our ministry, in our, in our lives. It was the case for Jesus. It's still the case for us today. And lastly, we shouldn't keep Christ a secret. We should be sharing him with the whole world at all costs and all the time. So that is our lesson for today, a wonderful lesson. We got to share a day in the life of Jesus in his ministry. Next week, his lesson is titled Controversies. Some of what Jesus talks about and some things that are in here, when we put it up against the world or we put it up against other teachings, there comes some controversies. And Jesus, some of his words led into controversies in that time. And that's what we're going to be sharing next week. We'd love for you to join us next week here at Sacramento Central Church with Central Study Hour. So if you enjoyed this lesson and you'd like to share it with somebody else or you'd like a copy for yourself, please reach out to us at uh, 916-457-6511. Or you can reach us at email at csh at saccentral.org. And give us this offer. The offer is c 202 
428. Uh, give us your information, especially your direction and your name. We'd love to be able to share a CD or DVD of this lesson with you if you've enjoyed it and you want a copy. Thank you so much, for everybody, for being with us. Uh, I'm completely honored to be able to share the Word of God and this lesson with you today. God bless each and every one of you.